Uh, good afternoon. This is your host, Guillermo Salvatier, uh, on, for Perspectives on Energy here on Tech Tech Hawaii. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, uh, I am the Director of International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute. And discuss, our discussion today revolves around the uh, Energy and Information Administration at the U.S. government's website, eia.gov. And we will be discussing their energy outlook uh, that they published in March of 2023. It's a year ago. I am eager to see what they're going to do when they publish 2024. But I want to, and I want to see how those projections vary from one year to the next because these go out to 2030, 2040, 2050. So definitely something to consider. Um, this is information that's available for the general public, and it's accessible at ea.gov/aeo. So that is on that site, and uh, you're welcome to look at it. I will go ahead and uh, cover that today, give some opinions, um, important things to consider when we're discussing, the, for example, the energy outlook, right? Um, so let's go ahead and go into the next slide, if you will, please. All right, so what does the EIA do, right? And that's the Energy Information Administration, and they, they would provide statistical an, uh, analysis and it's an agency, basically, that, that allows them, it's not just power, but also they look at all forms of energy. Uh, and they are, they work in conjunction with the Department of Energy, right? But here in this case, what they're concerned with is that the statistical and analytical aspects of, of uh, projecting uh, trends for the uh, any aspect of the energy in this country, right? They're a premier source for energy information. And the important disclaimer, they put that on that third bullet, that's by law, our data analyses and forecasts are independent of approval by any other officer or employee of the U.S. government. So again, a lot of these like uh, government websites or government organizations usually have uh, appointed uh, employees. So important thing to put as a disclaimer i was wondering why they have to put that there to me it kind of now now it alerts me to figure out okay so what's what's the motivation behind some of these reports so independent of approval but i'm sure there's some influence so and we'll go into why that's in there no i, I don't want to cast doubt on what these administrations uh published uh given under the current current administration right but um see the white house policies but we'll get into more details there, and I'll see where, where we're at and one of the things we're looking at. So, again, this Energy Outlook, annual Energy Outlook for 2023, looks at the long-term trends of the United States. Um, and, of course, this ultimately affects uh, things that happen in Hawaii, specifically since they're so far off and they're not connected to any of the regions. In a lot of cases, for example, whatever happens in the, in the mainland does have an impact on what happens on the islands or some of the uh, outward territories. So next slide, please. So uh, focus on a narrative, right? So in this case, so one of the things that they're they're basically talking about is what's new on this energy outlook. Well, okay, they want to focus on a narrative, which I feel is is basically um, the energy mix in this case is really changing from fossil fuels to renewables. Yes, that is the narrative. That is the policy. That is the motivator and driving force behind this current administration's change. However, if Kind of hard to see in this particular slide because the text is really, really tiny, and I don't know if that's on purpose or not. But yeah, you're going to see a lot of a lot of base load generation being replaced by renewables. To me, that presents a problem because of the fact that it's going to ha it's going to have an impact on reliability, right? Um, of course, you look at the whole the whole fine print right there. Power demand is increasingly met by renewables throughout the projection period. The share of natural gas and nuclear generation declines. Okay, natural gas remains pretty steady, so does nuclear. But at the same time, nuclear power is, and I'm looking at the fine print here some more, nuclear power is closer, is outcompeted by renewable power, even in the low zero carbon technology. Of course, they were making a lot of assumptions here. And I have a feeling that they're they're looking at at large scale nuclear facilities, the traditional pressurized water reactor stuff. And I think in this case, you know, they they may not be uh, taken into account the impact we're going to see with small modular reactors. And I think that's coming. So um, that's an important thing in that narrative. And I know that they focus on that, but uh, they have three different cases with three different types of scenarios and a lot of them impact with the uh, infrastructure, the uh, by the administration infrastructure out right? um, 
also the range of results are looking at whether they take into a high acceptance, low acceptance. They also look at the combination cases depending on how that is, uh, how the uh, it, it, the uh, Infrastructure Act has taken, what impact it's had on this particular product. Next slide, please. So in this case, a lot of numbers, but one of the things you look at here is that they're definitely, they're definitely expecting a lot of growth. When it comes to oil and gas supply, right, they're looking at uh, uh, quite a few changes, but still quite some consumption, uh, higher drilling costs relative to to a reference case, and then uh, whether it's a high or a low uh, projection on on the on the forecast, you're still going to have uh, resource recoveries happening, right? Fifty percent lower oil and gas resource recovery, and fifty percent higher drilling costs. Whereas a high, you're going to have 50% higher oil and gas resource recovery, right? So it all depends on how how much on these projections they they lean, uh, depending on the on the consumption and demand, right? So when they say uh, also zero carbon technology on the electric power sector, and if you have, for example, a low uptake, it's about 40% reduction in cost by 2050. High, there's no reduction in cost. So ultimately, really, it's it's. Um, I think we're getting to the point, really what this tells me is that we're getting to the point where we're approaching the renewables need. Uh, every extra renewable we're putting in, in, in service is forcing us to back down uh, much needed base load generation, which in, in itself, and I'll show on a graph later, how they're even showing you that you know curtailment is, is going to be a factor unless you change that with more dispatchable generation. Uh, also with combinations, right? You're looking at different projections here and so many projected cases. So we'll, we'll be looking at that as well further on. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the Inflation Reduction Act issues in focus, for example, uh, they're looking at no IRA case, a high uptake case, and a low uptake case. And we'll see that in some of the uh, graphs and projections showing the upper bound, the lower bound, and then some middle, some, some, I won't call that a middle bound, but a middle track, right? And we'll see some of that what that looks like. And we're looking at some of those assumptions. Now, um, the IRA, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, also has in it the Infrastructure Act, and that plays a role in how this, this uh, took into effect. Next slide, please. Uh, a lot of incentives, right, especially when it comes to uh, those caveats. So some of these incentives, again, throw off the whole projection. They throw off the cost in the case. I did notice a really, really heavy incentivizing of like in renewable solar. They did a, they kind of pulled away from wind. And the, the interesting thing with solar is that the majority of this like of this dispatchable base load is going to be replaced with this renewable solar, which really all you can do is really curtail it, right? Which I, so I'm wondering what's going to happen and when it comes to reliability, are they going to pair that with the energy storage? Or are they going to rely on something else to actually be dispatchable? Or are they banking on being able to back down and redispatch dramatically redispatch natural gas fire generation? We shall see. <clears throat> and so, next slide, please. So, one of the things that are interested in here, right? For example, is that. Regardless of the scenario, you see CO2 emissions fall across all of those projections and cases, some more than others, but there's a, the, in the worst case, you're going to see a 20 or 30% reduction on some of those you know, CO2 emissions, which is great news, right, by 2030 and 2050. <clears throat> but um, I think as we're trending forward, we're making these, these changes in our, particularly in our uh, energy production. Now, the rest of the world may not be trending the same direction. I mean, uh, for every new... Uh, Coal plant that we're shutting down in the U.S. Uh, we're, we see maybe four or five new coal plants coming online in the either the uh, industrialized part of the world or and then of course also in, in developing parts of, of the globe. So I'm not gonna name which continents they are, what countries, but uh, as we're shutting them down, other countries are of course putting them online, brand new carbon plants. So it's an issue right there. But again, in spite of that, right, we'll, hopefully we'll see a general downward trend in carbon emissions. Uh, the other thing, renewable capacity grows in our regions uh, in these 2023 cases looking at the future. But of course, they're saying here supported by growth and install battery capacity. I think that's optimistic at this time. I think they're overlooking the fact that batteries are really expensive. They're having trouble uh, quantifying that cost. 
and uh, and, and they still haven't quite gone around that e even at this point. So I think it's an optimistic projection. I'm not sure where they got a lot of those numbers. I try to find that on the actual report, and I had trouble seeing that. So in a lot of cases, they were hoping that the cost over time was reduced, like based on the example of what happened with solar, or what happened with wind, where the, the production cost went, went down, or the capitalization cost for construction went down. So uh, also, and that's what they're saying, uh, technological advancements and like, dry projected decrease in demand, slight energy intensity. So uh, one of the things that I think we're, they're, they're assuming is that we're going to consume less power on our side maybe at a residential level, but industrial, as economic growth happens, that is, that, that's gonna drive consumption up. So I'm curious to see what that will do with gas emission, with, uh, not, with carbon emissions going forward. And the last bullet point here, the highlights is that basically says that the US remains a net exporter of petroleum products and natural gas through 2050. Maybe we'll be consuming less of it, so we'll be able to export it, but that tells you it's going to be consumed in other parts of the world. That's why with the national, with, with the, uh, we're a net exporter of those products and likely to be that way through 2050. Next slide, please. So on this graph, we're looking at, uh, again, some good news in this case, uh, depending on what projection you look at. If you have, uh, you see the blue, kind of like the dark red, black and green, right? So if you have high economic growth, you're going to see a slight increase in carbon dioxide emissions in this country uh, starting in 2035 and going up slightly to 2050. Uh, if you compare 2030, right, and to 2005, we fell 25 or 38 below 2005 levels. So it is a definitely huge improvement by 2030. So I think it's, it's great. Uh, but again, we got to watch what happens with high economic growth uh, when you're looking at the uh, 2035, where it begins to creep up again, uh, up to close to 80%, right, to where it was before. Um, if there's no no IRA, then it kind of stays flat. If there's the reference right here is kind of below that. And then if you look at low economic growth, one, of course, has to send a decrease at that point, because naturally, the way we're implementing uh, these new uh, renewable resources and also changing the way we consume our behaviors and our industrial needs and technology, that's going to inevitably change the way we we create uh, carbon emissions. So a lot of that really has to do with the fact that you know we can become more efficient. Next slide, please. Okay, a little bit more. What happens with uh, CO two emissions? So you can see here, there's a lot of focus on CO two emissions, and then a lot of focus on where we're going to be trend wise. Maybe and I think that comes in a later slide. But as you can see here, the uh, the dominating force in this, this presentation, of course, is carbon emissions. So that tells you a lot about what the narrative is regarding this administration and the reports and how that is probably influenced by the White House. Right? So again, in this case, right, CO2 emissions, again, general projections, 2022 going forward, for the most part, a lot of them are, you see a reduction, right? And then uh, high uptake cases go further and they reach reduction of 34 and 33 and 34 respectively. So again, really optimistic, I think, and this is pretty realistic in this case. But then again, a lot of that depends on how much we replace uh, base load generation that's coal with the, uh, carbon, zero carbon generation. Now, that could be solar, but in my opinion, I think it's going to end up being, being nuclear. Uh, the next slide, please. And we're talking about capacity. Oh, boy. And here's where that's a touchy subject, right? Uh, renewable generating capacity grows. Of course, they're replacing, they're replacing coal. With renewables, just great. Problem is, they're they're, they're going to need to support that with installed battery capacity, which I think is not realistic. I think more than likely it's going to be more of a nuclear thing where they they're going to have to re react with the variability, or likely they're going to be doing a lot of curtailments. We'll see quite a bit of that coming forward. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at the different scenarios here, right? Most scenarios, total installed generating capacity more than doubles across most scenarios. And yes, that's kind of what you're going to look like for 2022 history and 2050 gigawatts, right? So 2022 is a very top horizontal bar and everything else but beneath that are different scenarios, right? When you're looking at that. In most cases, uh, you're going to see a lot more solar, and that is their projection. And, uh, and then, of course, some standalone storage. 
What they don't tell you is that the nuclear is they're only counting one type of nuclear, so they're not really even looking at small modular reactors, you know, not playing a role in this. We shall see what happens. My concern here is that you're going to see a lot of base load generation being changed by highly variable and problematic uh, solar in this case. So we'll see what happens. A lot of duck curves are going to happen in this case, and then uh, middle of the day uh, valley issues. Uh, next slide, please. And again, some more projections. This is looking at uh, how power demand will be met by renewables. So sure. Uh, and then uh, uh, again, the whole trend here is most of it's gonna be solar, right? In this case, because of course it's gonna get cheaper and that's gonna be the thing that they're gonna tend to install throughout throughout the country as they replace uh, the typical coal fire generation, which is base load. My concern is that it's base load that they're replacing with uh, variable renewable resource. Now, if you look at natural gas over there at the top right, that seems to decline a little bit, but then it kind of goes up again in uh, past 2030, between 2020 and 35, and that's consistent with the expected economic growth that they, they might project at that point. So, again, you may need, for example, uh, natural gas to be able to manage, for example, the variability of some of this like uh, wind and solar uh, that will be on the system. If you also notice that 2030, uh, wind, going to tend to stay flat. They're not going to add any more new wind capacity at that point. And there's a couple of good reasons for that. We'll cover in a minute. Next slide, please. Uh, solar and wind generation, that will generate the majority of power in the US, which again, is it's great, but it's a little concerning because you're noticing in blue here how you're uh, replacing natural gas, of course, is declining and with, with high uptake. You do low uptake, you're going to see natural gas playing a, big, a bigger role. Whereas solar is going to play play an outsized role between 2020 and 2050. Uh, concerning for me in the sense that you know they're they're trying to get into, for example, uh, starting to eat away at um, at a uh, base load generation, and you're relying mostly on natural gas generation to be able to like uh, absorb a lot of that variability. That's going to present a problem, especially when you get to the. the the, the graphs on the on the high uptake where you're seeing a lot less generation that's fired by the gas, which is dispatchable. Uh, what I foresee is a lot of uh, is a lot of uh, perhaps uh, curtailing uh, some of these solar side outputs. We'll, we'll see. But again, they're they're making no mention here that nuclear really is that that conventional large scale nuclear solar. I mean nuclear sites, and not the SMRs that are dispatchable. Next slide, please. And here we go. This is an example of what happens with intermittent renewables, right? So, and they and they admit it here. They're not they're not shy from the fact that they and they they embrace the fact that more intermittent renewables lead to more curtailment and use of a battery storage. So they're betting a lot on battery storage, but the technology is not even not even there yet. So uh, again, really optimistic, um, really really best case. I'm not gonna say it's unicorns and rainbows, but. I have my doubts in some respects when it comes to bat batteries being that predominant uh, support system for the renewable variability. I think you're going to see if, if if this falls short and we don't have SMRs or a lot of natural gas in place, you're going to see a lot more curtailments like you do on that uh, on that low zero carbon tech cost case on 2050 on the graph on the far right. That dark gray image there on the top is going to be curtailments and that's how they're going to manage that 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 load versus the excess generation in that particular event next slide please so tech advances right and uh they're hoping that's going to drive a decrease in demand side energy intensity so yes yes i definitely see more 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 uh, efficiency and technology changing and how that's driven uh, my concern here is that uh, transportation is going to uh, maybe uh, electric vehicles, but I'm seeing a lot of manufacturers are getting away from that and they're getting more towards maybe hydrogen or a different type of source. Toyota, for example, has decided to completely abandon the whole EV, th uh, EV push, whereas others have changed the way they're looking at it. So there may be an EV component out there. I think in a lot of cases, EVs will become part of the energy storage system in most residential areas. I think that would be ideal, but you're not seeing a lot of uh, a lot of drivers uh, rushing to buy uh, electric vehicles. In fact, you're seeing some of the uh, rental car markets starting to dump 
a lot of these EVs, uh, Hertz, for example, has done quite quite a bit of that, and and some of these EVs are being sold way, way, way under on market as they were the year before. Also, in these projections, you're looking at um, on slide 17, you're looking at uh, sorry, slide 17, you're looking at uh, the projections, for example, of industrial load. It's gonna it's whether one way or another, it's that economic growth is gonna drive a great deal of consumption right so that's a big deal that, that that's a concern in some cases because industrial load really has a bigger impact on supply uh transportation it's mm, a lot of that could be electric but you know you could also be looking at different types of uh combustible fuels residential and commercial is not going to change a whole lot right in this case and a lot of that for example it's not very residential consumption is not really very sensitive to changes in technology uh, at a very small scale, but industrial is going to be interesting because you may actually, it's not really becoming more efficient, but rather you're going to have a lot more industry and industrial manufacturing and processes coming back to the U.S. You know, over the next you know, 20, 30 years. Next slide, please. So energy intensity, right? So we're looking at, uh, there's going to be a decline. Um, that's Residential, yes, residential for sure. Uh, I can definitely see uh, uh, a noticeable decline in, in how we consume power in the household. Perhaps we're going to be a lot more efficient. Perhaps we're going, to, we're going to be prosumers because maybe we're installing energy storage at home at a residential scale, or perhaps we're going to be using a different type of uh, energy efficient cooling or heat. Same thing with commercial. That's a projection they're seeing. Pretty, pretty narrow band going over, so it's not going to be too too severe compared to the others. But on the next slide, however, we go to slide 19, that uh, light duty vehicle fuel economy is gonna improve, right? So one of the things that they're looking at is perhaps the way they consume fuel. In this case, high high price of oil, low price of oil, and the uh, market share of electric light duty vehicles, right? So you're gonna be seeing quite a few of them as well, especially if the price is higher, you're gonna be seeing a lot more EVs on the road. Price of oil is lower. You'll be seeing, of course, naturally a lot lower a lot of you, your vehicles on the road because of that. Next slide, please. Uh, incentives, again, uh, another projection of how, for example, incentives help for the sale of EVs. That is changing right now. I'm, I'm kind of concerned. Again, this was, this was uh, back in 2023, 2024, a lot of like different uh, Lucid and a lot of other companies, even Rivian is having trouble staying staying afloat. And right now, even Tesla, for example, is has been reducing, dropping their prices and to the point that even like uh, the used car market, of course, is way, way, way lower than the new car market. So, and of course, a lot of that, these incentives have to do, for example, with the federal tax credit, right? Where like, you know, you can only get them on the new cars and the used cars. So these projections, okay, they're, they're affecting how many people by um, market share, but again, you notice a saturation past 2030, the market pretty much saturates at between 50 and 20%, nothing go beyond that. It's something important to consider. All right, uh, next slide, 21. And next exporter of petroleum, which is again, tells you that right, that, that means somebody else in the world is gonna be consuming all that petroleum and all that, all that uh, Fossil fuel, right? So in all cases, right, we're going to become a, still remain the net exporter of, of uh, fossil fuels uh, throughout the near and and and, and far future, right? So many uh, barrels per day projections is still going to be significant throughout the world, right? In this case, and that is something that we got to consider as we uh, make these uh, decisions and policy decisions, right? Again, with liquefied natural gas, again, that's going to be popular in the rest of the world, especially as we compete with Russia. Problem is with that is that there there was a, a pipeline, whereas here we're we're shipping that in uh, in uh, in uh, ocean going vessels, which is not that not that economic compared to others. So uh, that is all I have for today. I think we uh, one of the things I want to look at next is how LNG and uh, dry versus uh, compressed natural gas, liquid natural gas is going to impact the markets. One of the things that I think I really want to present coming up next is when they issue the next release. You see this one was. Uh, next slide, please, in the last slide. And you're going to see how, how that one, for example, has, uh, we're due for the March, we're, we're pretty much due for the 2024 um, AEO. And I'm curious to see how those projections may have changed or maybe how the narrative changed. 
So again, definitely a lot of information on these sites. I really encourage you all to take a look and uh, go to the eia.gov slash AEO and uh, the energy outlook, and uh, it'll be a great thing to understand. All right, thank you again, and uh, join me again soon in the next, uh, on the, the next episode. Have a great day, and uh, feel free to make comments and uh, uh, like and subscribe, and I make comments, and I'll do my best to respond to them as much as I can. Thank you.